It is so nice to have everybody gathered together today um, in October of 2023. Um, well, I guess not quite October, September of 2023 to help us celebrate the legacy of Mina Loy. Um, 2023, of course, represents the centennial of the publication of the Lunar Baydecker. This weekend also represents the conclusion of our presentation of Lu Mina Loy, Strangeness is Inevitable. It is so exciting to have distinguished scholars gathered together as well as members of the public um, who have had an opportunity to enjoy this exhibition. I'm Anne Collins Goodyear, one of the co-directors of the museum, and it has been my pleasure to have an opportunity to do my best to serve as a shepherd of this exhibition. However, real credit must be extended to the curator of the first exhibition of Mina Loy's visual art in over 64 years. The last time this work was presented to the public, and it was only a small segment of it, was 64 years ago when Marcel Duchamp shared some of the objects that you can see upstairs in New York at the Bodley Gallery. We are so grateful to Jennifer for everything that she has done, not only to reunite materials from that exhibition, but to contextualize them within the larger sweep of Mina Loy's career from the early part of the 20th century through and even beyond the end of her life in 1966. With respect to Mina Loy's legacy, there's somebody else here in the audience who I want particularly to acknowledge, Roger Conover, a member of um, the Bowdoin class of 1972, an alumnus of this college, which makes the opportunity to recognize him here all the more special. Roger Launius, who is well known um, to perhaps everybody in this audience, has done a remarkable job in helping to preserve and share Mina Loy's legacy through his groundbreaking anthologies of her work, The Last Lunar Baydecker of 1982, and the lost Lunar Bay Baydecker of 1996. That scholarship has in turn helped to serve as a foundation for many other scholars who are gathered with us, both in person, um, who you will have an opportunity to hear from shortly, and I am thinking particularly of Nancy Cool, Carla Kelsey, and Sarah Krangle, as well as scholars who are joined with us from the, from uh, the UK, uh, Don Adis, who we will hear from in a moment, and Anne Lauterbach, who will be joining us virtually from New York. It is very exciting to have this opportunity to bring together the visual art with an awareness of Loy's literary work. And we are delighted that we will have an opportunity to engage with new questions, to reflect upon lessons learned from the visual arts, and to think about how our understanding of Loy has been impacted by this show and perhaps things that we might want to explore further going forward. Um, we have such a distinguished group of participants with us today that we actually developed um, a, a, a program that includes bios of all of our speakers together with um, the sequence of uh, panels, and I am going to refer you to those bios and just offer a very short introduction to each of our speakers. We are thrilled that Professor Don Adis, who is an emeritus professor in the School of Philosophy and Art History at the University of Essex, is able to join us uh, from the United Kingdom this morning. Professor Adis is a fellow of the British Academy, a former trustee of the Tate, a professor of the history of art at the Royal Academy, and has been awarded a CBE in 2013 for her services to art history. We are thrilled that this extraordinary scholar of surrealism and Dada art also has been able to contribute to the exhibition catalog. 
We are thrilled that she is with us this afternoon. And without further ado, we will ask Don Adis to launch us. And I will ask you to join me in welcoming Don to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's been a great disappointment for me that I have not been able to see the exhibition itself. And I had really hoped it would be possible. And I'm very envious of those of you who are there now and have seen it. It's very remarkable. There have been some wonderful reviews of the exhibition. But uh, I, I, I wasn't able to make it. However, I'm very happy to say that I have seen three of Minamoy's works in the flesh over the years, two of the constructions, and one wonderful drawing. And I just wanted to, in a, in a way, I'm revisiting how I started my uh, research and my essay for the catalogue here by starting with this, uh, this extraordinary construction, Communal Cots. Communal Cot. I saw this in 2019 for the first time in Francis Nauman's gallery in New York, and it stopped me in my search tracks. I, I had absolutely no idea who could have done it. I mean, I, I really couldn't locate it anywhere. Um, now, of course, we are a little bit more familiar with other of her constructions. Had I been then, I might have had a go at guessing things. Minoloi. But then I had no idea. And it seemed to me a very, very, a very strange and really quite shocking work. And I want, you know, all these figures who appear to have fallen on the pavement, um, lying down where they are, uh, tramps, pressed in rags, much smaller than the paving stones. I mean, there's a very strange effect of perspective. Now, I, I didn't really at the time, I wasn't at the time so familiar with her image of poetry. And of course, there are poems that are very, very closely related to this, which give one a much better sense of what her attitude to these, the mums, these figures and the Bowery, uh, with whom basically she was associating quite closely at the time she moved to New York, to that part of New York in the 1940s. Now, so, so that's a, just a good introduction. What, what Pam suggested I might do was kind of re revisit some of the methods that I was using at the time to examine her work, and in particular, to, to look at, at the question I asked at the very end of the essay in the, um, the exhibition catalogue, which was, why was she not included in the very big exhibition in 1961 called The Art of Assemblage that William Sykes curated, and which would seem to be exactly where she should have been included and indeed recognized. And was her exclusion one of the reasons for her relative disappearance from uh, basically from, from, from the history of art in the in, in the 20th century? So I'll come I'll come back to that in a moment. But I just want to, to have another another look at where it all began for me. Um, I oh this is the this is the third work uh, of the three works, the Common Cots, the uh, house hunting will, will come on to. Uh, this is the, the um, self portrait from about 1905, which the, um, the, the curator and critic Matthew Gale, when he reviewed the, uh, the exhibition, I think it was in the Burlington, noted that three of us who had written about this portrait had completely different interpretations mm -hmm. of what her glance, what her look is like. Um, I mean, interpreted as a, as, a, as a look of, of great sadness because she had a number of, of tragedies in her life by, already by then. I'm afraid I saw it as a rather haughty, we talk about Edwardian portrait, uh, a, a very, very conscious of her great beauty, which I think is also quite important and worth bearing in mind for the later constructions, where she had a strong sense that she was old and that was no longer beautiful. Um, so that that that, that drawing was also for the Francis Norman exhibition in 2019. So I really began my research. Uh, I was I was working on the little magazine Rogue, uh, which is extremely rare, very difficult to, to find. And in Rogue, it was particularly interesting 
to see the way that her, her poetry and her work as, as her visual work as an artist are related to one another. And that is one of the questions that I have been asking myself, is, is how, one de how one addresses this question that the, uh, the word in English, um, the video of the verbal, when somebody is as extraordinarily uh, brilliant in both, um, just, you know, a great poet, but also a, a fantastic artist, how does it, how does it fit together? Um, and I don't really have an answer to that, but I, mean, I remain very fascinated by it. And the, um, this particular drawing by her, which is called Consider Your Grandmother's Stays, and I have had a very happy time working on the question of forces in relation to this drawing and the, uh, the, the, social, the social and feminist position of uh, you know, attitudes, women's attitudes to horses at the time in 1916 when, when this was done. Um, and it, it, the, the poetry and the image, I think, are, uh, this, is, this is the poem called Virgins, Serpents, Minus Dots, which I uh, relate in a sense to this that in a rather roundabout way to that drawing. Um, she, she, in a way, had, had a, a strong views about being, having an identity as a woman and having independence as a woman and making your own way in the world, being able to write your poetry and make your work. But of course, she had a very difficult time trying to earn a living. But she did, on the whole. Um, I mean, I'm not going to go into the, that background, but, but but just to say that at this time, 1916, she had been a member of, or he had been close to the Futurists, so she wrote out a manifesto, a feminist manifesto in that context, which contained the very radical argument that the only way to change the situation in which a woman has to choose between parasitism, prostitution, or negation is to destroy the physical purity in which her fictitious value resides. And so the, the drawing, um, the Virgin Minus Verse, which is Clara Tice's the comic take on the, on, the, um, on the question, really, the woman, the identity of him. Um, and uh, you have to recognize that the title of Fina Lois' poem, Virgins Plus Curtains Minus Dots, is not to do with, with decorative dots, but with do, which is the marriage portion that comes with as the virgin who is to be married. And so she's attacking the whole idea, the whole kind of social structure, if you like, um, of, of the, the nature of marriage and the subjugation, basically, of women in that, uh, in that context. So, so, that's, so, so there's, a, there's a big background for that. Um, and the relationship between the, the, the words and the images uh, are extraordinary. Um, I think in some ways, it gets even stronger later on that the, her drawings at this time have a slight on sort of Aubrey Beardsley esque look, but the constructions are very powerful, very strong, and, and I think the, 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 the poems have a very similar, um, uh, a, a, a very similar capacity to kind of, you know, extract very strong feeling and very strong attitudes from individual words. Now, um, so uh, just to have a now to look a bit clear at the at the instructions um, in order, if you like, I think to you know to keep bearing in mind this question: why why she fell off radar? Why she was not included in the art of assemblage? When it would look as if her work is absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, could, could have been very importantly central to it. I don't know. It, I mean, it could be that it's too direct, that it's too, it has too many figures in it, it's not sufficiently engaged with sort of modernist uh, debates about abstraction. Uh, I think there are questions there that, that, that are quite interesting. Um, also, to have a work of this, I mean, it's a strong, very powerful work. Which obviously, in a sense, is generated by a phrase, by the phrase hanging somebody out to dry, meaning sacrificing them. And so, this is, in a sense, a, a kind of a, you know, a take on the whole idea of Christ sacrificed. Um, it, it's very, 
it's quite extraordinary. I mean, I don't know whether you could see. No, I think I won't. I won't go there. I'll, I'll go on. Um, coming back to communal cots. Um, the work was hung horizontally in Francis Nyman's gallery, but photographs by Berenice Abbott show it vertical, which is, so therefore, how I put it on the left. Um, I hope you could make out the little figures. They are quite precise. They have faces. Um, this, this one in particular, which is uh, either in the bottom right or, or, the, or the top, but here it's in the bottom right. It's uh, on this way up. And you can see the detail of the face. It's constructed of, I think, mostly paper on the uh, on, on the, the, the boards that make up the <coughs> side, if you like. Um, and I'm going to read some of the, the, the poem. Um, I've got time for this, sorry. Um, so, this when the hot cross bun describes the Bowery and its inhabitants in a mixture of humor, sympathy, and the grotesque. I quote, a lurid lay leading misfortune's monsters along the alcoholic's exit to Ecstasia. And always on the Fulton Street, a common cot, embalmed in rum, under an unseen balcony of dream, licking his inverted sky at the flagstone, prone lies the body of the flop, where he drop. One still savours the flavour of the illness. So she's introduced this little aspect of, of, of a kind of erotic figure um, whose shoe uh, looks very much like a sort of sexual organ there between the legs. It's very strange. Mm. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's, it, but you, you wonder, when I first saw it, I, I thought it was a very strong social critique. But it, it seems to me that, that if one reads the poem, um, and we should look at more about her relationship with, with the Bums, who were you know, happy up of it, except what she sometimes described them as. But uh, she compares them, what she calls the inferno faces of the destitute. She compares them with the upright, comfortable citizens, well-dressed and prospering. And for them, she finds this very telling phrase, Practicalities elite. It's a wonderful phrase. The elite of the practical, which of course is so far from these figures who are you know, prostrate on the ground in a balcony of dream. But these, the practicalities elite, don't wonder for an instant about the life of the bums. <clears throat> so I go, so wonder why defeat by dignity of the majority often reveals in close up an inferno face a nobler origin and practicalities elite. So, so she's not so much making, making a sort of a, a case for uh, you know, social critical intervention to try and prevent the bums from, the, from, uh, uh, from wasting their lives as recognizing that they have their lives and they have their dreams and so on. So I think it's, I may be wrong about that. It's just, just a, um, a suggestion. Now, um, I'm just going to look particularly uh, for a moment. Right, about, how much time have I got now? Um, five minutes? Abs five? Yes, absolutely. Yes. By all means. Um, yep. Uh, okay. Um, one of the questions that Anne and I have been discussing is her relationship with Duchamp, and in particular, the relationship between the constructions that she's working on from probably the late 40s or even mid film 40s, I'm not quite sure when, probably about 1948 onwards. And the work that Marcel Duchamp was engaged in making in complete secrecy, so nobody knew about it, called Et en Dante. And there are very strange links, <coughs> I think, between the two. Um, they were, of course, Minoloy and Duchamp, very old friends on New York days 1916, 1917, from Days of Rogue. The blind man and the fountain incident, which I try to need to go into now. But this is, could be, we're not sure, portraits of Mina um, and of Duchamp. Uh, strange relationship there. Um, this is uh, Duchamp, who helped organize 
uh, an exhibition of first, an only exhibition of time during the lifetime, I think, of the constructions at the uh, Bodley Gallery. In 1959, and uh, there he is with one of the works called Bums Praying. This photograph of Bums Praying. Again, uh, nobler, nobler than practically they need. And I just wanted to pause for a moment on Duchamp's um, uh, uh, on, on the, the, um, the invitation note about the exhibition, which uh, Anne and I have talked about. It, it, it's really it's really very interesting, and although it's quite brief, um, it, it's it's full of it's full of, sort of potential ideas. I hope you can see it and read it. It says bottom right, written what, in, in chalk on blackboard. It's not quite clear how that's been done, but Duchamp has written Mina's poems a deux dimensions et demi, two and a half dimensions. Oh, but yeah. A buffon ink. High relief and lower depths ink. Marcel Duchamp, Admiral it. And I think the Admiral it actually has, it's, it's a little stronger than just admires. It means he wonders, and Ad, Admiral it is the Latin, I mean, he, he's wondering at these works. Um, and, and when he, two and a half dimensions, and they are, he, he's playing on the high and low there. I mean, he's playing on, you know, this is, this is low line, but she has a, a, a strong sense of the value and spirituality of these figures. So high relief and low depths. The uh, So it's, these are, these are relief works in a sense, uh, in that form. Okay, but actually there's more we can say about that, and I think Anne has, uh, has ideas about it too. Um, and it's written very interestingly about the fact that 1959 was the year that Duchamp's monograph by Robert Lebel uh, came out, which was tremendously influential in, in New York. Um, this is the. This is the. And so the. Just to, just to draw attention, this is, this is um, no parking, in our last construction. Um, and be mentioned, the butterfly on the top of the garbage can is made, I think, of flattened drinks tin, something like that. So it's using garbage, they are using rubbish, they are using uh, and, and paper and, and glue and what and paint and egg boxes and so on, but they are basically built of detritus. And I, I wanted at this point, therefore, to both draw a comparison and a con contrast with Duchamp's famous Et en um, which some people may well have seen in Philadelphia. Um, I, I, I feel like I, I'm not apologizing for the image on the right because um, it, it really is not possible to photograph it properly. Um, as you can see from the door on the left, what you have to do is look through the two little peep holes in the wooden door, and that is what you see framed through the brick arch. It's the figure of a woman, um, made, made of um, pig skin, actually, and it's a parchment. Um, and it is effectively also um, in two and a half dimensions. I mean, it is certainly not three dimensional in that you can't walk around it, but also she is lying flat on the ground, and you can only see the relief form of her body. So this is, it, 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 one thinks, well, in writing that description of, of, of Mila Lois constructions, uh, did he have in mind his own work in two and a half dimensions? Um, very, very little was, was, was well, I think, no, basically. The, the old work came, came out related to it, but nobody knew that the big installation was being made. Um, this, uh, this work on the left is obviously very close to it. It's a small piece. And what, but what I want to do here is to both. I wonder, could I mean, could the idea of this book have actually come from seeing the Lewis constructions? I mean, I, I'm certainly not trying to argue that it did, but I'd just like to think of the possibility. Because they were so unlike anything else that people were doing. And his Edmond Donnelly was so unlike 
anything that people do. The big contrast between them is that his is made of luxury materials. Part of it was the expensive thing to have. I mean, in a way, you had paper. It's got velvet. The, the, the body is lined in velvet. Uh, so it, it, it has this appearance of luxury, where, in, in a sense, it's nothing to do but contrast with the extreme poverty of, of Minoloi's materials. Um, so the question this, this exhibition, Art and Sense, 1961, um, very important show, curious exhibition, it takes a very strongly historical line about the development of collage into objects. And as William Sykes writes in the introduction, it, it addresses an expanded concept of collage, which is no longer adequate for current practice. And he defines the characteristics of the work included in this exhibition as firstly, predominantly assembled rather than painted, drawn, modeled, <coughs> carved. And secondly, entirely or in part, their constituent elements are preformed natural or manufactured material, objects or fragments, not intended as barbed materials. And I'll just read a few, uh, a few photographs of, of um, sprints from the exhibition catalogue, the Art Assemblage. Uh, Yushan, of course, features very prominently. Um, and I'll, I'll quote again from Bill Sykes' introduction. He says, although the majority of the works included are unquestionably works of art, others were fabricated expressly to dispel an aura of authority, profundity, and sanctity. There are even pieces here that cannot be called art at all in the accepted sense of that term. They are ready-made assemblages. And of course, uh, the, the ready the, 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 is, a, is a major sort of, if you like, um, commentary on, uh, on, on modern art, but also on the notion of collage, uh, particularly the assisted ready-made on, on the left here, the bicycle wheel. And, uh, he came, Sykes so comes back to the radio page, and I quote, according to the only definition of art Duchamp will accept as true for all times and places, all man-made objects are works of art. But what, what strikes one about the, uh, the other works in this exhibition is that going on from the very strong presentations of Dada and Surrealism, and here you've got the merit of Fur cover, cover and stuff, and the squirrel uh, on the left, Lawrence Bell, uh, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the more recent works, Ken of Cornell as well, mm -hmm. uh, oh, perhaps I haven't got it, sorry. I'll come back to this. Oh, there we are, on the bottom. Um, can you see on the right? There, there are, the curious thing about the more recent works that are included in the Art of the Sandwich is that. Um, a very large number of the artists included are now completely forgotten. Uh, it, it, was, it was not an exhibition, in fact, which established people's reputations, but it established the idea of uh, an, an art of assemblage. Mm -hmm. um, it, it explored it, but many of the artists are not very well known, it's, and it, it's striking to see, if you look on, see, they do use their name materials, but, but very often they are actually quite painterly. And I think a work like Christ on the Clearsland or communal cult would have, would have been an extraordinarily startling presence among these relatively sort of well-behaved, even if they're using fun, fun um, ready-made objects, well-behaved objects. I'm looking at the right hand uh, spread now. Okay. So, okay, I, I couldn't get um, Yes, so, so the, uh, the, the, the problem of her relative, um, relative ob obscurity, uh, there are many, many reasons for it, I think. Um, but but I, find, I, I find the constructions extremely, uh, extremely strong and incredibly important. Um, and I think it's, you know, it, 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 but, but how you relate them, if you like, to the larger, the larger histories of 20th century art remains to me a question. Um, and 
the other day we were talking about this, and I said that I thought, if anything, her work relates more closely to Dada than anything else. So I don't want to pigeonhole her there. Mm -hmm. But I would like to end on that and see what perhaps other people might say about it. Thank you.